In this video, we're going to be looking at uh, at some of the ways where uh, we look at steam tables, and so far we've just taken these kind of numbers, right, numbers that we could look up here in the steam tables. We've taken these for granted. What we're going to look at today is uh, start to unpack where some of these different numbers come from, and this will be a process that takes a little bit longer than just uh, these next two videos, but we're going to start in these next two videos specifically looking at these columns. How do pressure, temperature, specific volume, right, where do all of these types of numbers come from? So that's where we're headed in today's video. We're going to start, if you have um, these notes handy, uh, I'm calling this equations of state part one. So I should first define what an equation of state is. Uh, we probably aren't going to use that terminology too much um, throughout this course, but I think it's, it's useful terminology because this is exactly what we're doing. We're looking at equations of state. So an equation of state, um, as I define up here, it relates state variables, right, which are different than path variables as we described in uh, the note handout in lecture. Um, things like pressure, specific volume, temperature, internal energy. Um, it describes these state variables or relates these straight state variables to describe the, the physical properties of a substance under given physical conditions. So if you want to know um, how these different things relate to one another under some given physical conditions, maybe those physical conditions are the conditions of a reaction, maybe they're the conditions of a steam power plant, um, somewhere in your steam cycle, maybe they're the conditions of the atmosphere of Venus. Um, whatever conditions those happen to be, um, an equation of state is going to be a, a way to be able to describe what a substance looks like in those conditions. So that's really what we're trying to do. Um, we can do just a quick example. Um, if we wanted to determine the weight of air in a standard classroom, I've given just made up dimensions here, six meters by eight meters by three meters. We could use the ideal gas law, right? You've, you've seen this before, so I'll just write it here. PV equals NRT. We're gonna call this R bar, uh, which I'll explain in a little bit, but right, what the ideal gas law assumes, or what is an ideal gas, it, it really consists of two different things. Um, gas atoms slash molecules uh, take up no space. So these are infinitesimally small. They're really teeny tiny, so tiny they don't take up any space. And the gas atoms or molecules don't... Um, don't interact with each other. Uh, so they don't attract, they don't repulse each other, they don't ever see each other at all. Uh, and these are kind of the two fundamental assumptions behind an ideal gas. Um, so if these two things are true, things behave like an ideal gas, right? We have um, here the ideal gas law, uh, where P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of moles, um, which we can also write as the mass divided by the molecular weight. T is the temperature, um, and R bar is the universal gas constant. I have two values of the universal gas constant here. Um, R bar equals 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin, or 1545 foot pounds force per pound mole um, R. You may not be familiar with this R. This is ranking, key of the, the ranking cycle fame. Um, and a ranking equals, it's the, the Fahrenheit version of Kelvin. So it's degrees Fahrenheit plus 459.67 
and zero ranking equals zero Kelvin. So zero is absolute zero. There are a lot more values um, of the universal cat gas constant, um, depending on whichever unit system. Uh, there are a lot more values on Wikipedia. That's actually a, a kind of handy source because it has in all different unit systems, um, it has calculated this uh, universal gas constant R bar. Just search universal gas constant and they'll pop up. Okay, so we wanted, kind of diverted a little bit, we wanted to determine the weight of air in a standard classroom. So let's actually go and do that problem. Right, PV equals NRT, so our pressure would be 101.3 um, kilopascal, or I'll just call it kilojoules per meter cubed. That's our pressure. Um, our volume was 6 times 8 times 3. Uh, that's 144 meters cubed. Um, that equals N times R, which is 8.314 uh, kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. And our temperature is 298 Kelvin, say it's room temperature. So that's an important thing to note. Uh, when we're using this, as you might remember, we need absolute temp. So we need to use Kelvin or ranking um, enable, in order to be able to use the ideal gas law. Otherwise you could get negative volumes when your temperature went negative. Um, things that just didn't make sense. The units on R should help you um, kind of remember that, right? It has a, a Kelvin and a ranking down there to just help remind you that yes, we do need to be using, um, we do need to be using absolute temperature. We can calculate here then the number of kilomoles. If we do that and, and plug in the algebra, it's 5.89 kilomoles of air. And if we go up and use, I, I put some molecular weights of air. Um, so the molecular weight of air is 28.8 grams per mole. We can multiply both the top and the bottom by 1,000. That would be 28.8 kilograms per kilomole. Um, you can also get fun units like this, like pounds per pound mole. So that would be um, multiplying the top and the bottom by the conversion factor from grams to pounds. I can't remember off the top of my head what that is, 459 or something like that. So a pound mole is 459 times bigger than a mole. A kilomole is 1,000 times bigger than a kilomole. So instead of 6.022 times 20, 10 to the 23rd, a kilomole is 6.022 times 10 to the 26. Um, so we can jump back and forth between all of these, these fun different units of molecular weight. And you might run across um, different ones of these depending on what unit system you happen to be in. Okay, so if we plug in times 28.8, um, we get that the mass of air is in our, our room was 169 kilograms. Uh, so we can answer questions like that. We, um, I think at least get kind of a surprising answer. We get, it's in a, in a classroom, there's actually a lot of air, about 170 kilograms. Um, so if you're alone in a classroom, there's more ma a larger mass of air in that room than you, uh, which is kind of a surprising result. Okay, so simple, we can use the ideal gas law. You all have done that before. Uh, let's see what this would look like in the context of a problem that uh, maybe we would have seen in this class. For example, if we have steam, we know the molecular weight. Um, it's superheated at 4,000 kilopascal and 300 Celsius, and we wanna calculate the specific volume. We could calculate the specific volume. We could either look it up in our steam tables um, or we could calculate it with cat3. I'm just going to use cat3 here today. Um, so let me drag in my cat3 window. 
So we are looking at steam, so we're on the water tables. Uh, we're looking at 300 Celsius and 4,000 pascals, so that's four megapascals. If we click OK, we get a specific volume of 0 0.05884. Zero point zero five eight eight four, and the units on that were meters cubed per kilogram. We could use the ideal gas law to do a similar thing. Okay, what that would look like. Um, we have kind of a new version of the ideal gas law, right? So we had P V equals N r bar t um, where right the volume equals the mass times the specific volume so we can have now pressure specific volume equals um, the number of moles over the mass times r bar t, um, where right the number of moles divided by the mass, that's just molecular, um, or one over molecular weight, rather. One over molecular weight. So we get this new equation, um, p specific volume equals r bar over the molecular weight, times temperature. And often it's the case that uh, we'll use a, this type of um, setting. So sometimes we actually will just call this, um, we call R bar over the molecular weight, we call that R, and then P specific volume equals RT. Um, so it's a way to, to get um, kind of like masses and volumes, get these extrinsic properties out of our equation. So then we have an, a version of the ideal gas law, which just is relating intrinsic properties like pressure, specific volume, the gas constant, and temperature. Uh, right, this gas constant is different for each substance. Right, because it's R bar over the molecular weight. So each different molecular weight is gonna give a different gas constant R. Um, so it's no longer the universal gas constant, it's a material or a substance specific gas constant. Okay, so let's go through and actually calculate this. Our, um, let's see, our pressure was 4,000 kPa. Another way of writing kPa is kilojoules per meter cubed times the specific volume equals I'll just write this, so this is 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin divided by 18 kilograms per kilomole. So that would be our specific, our gas constant for, for water. And our temperature, what was our temperature? Was 300 Celsius, so this would be 300 C plus 273.15 to convert it to Kelvin. Okay, so we can go through and then do um, some pretty basic algebra. We can calculate our, uh, our specific volume to be 0 0.0662 meters cubed per kilogram. So 
let's zoom out a second and see what happened. When we went and looked at cat three, uh, we found what the, the actual specific volume for steam is at these conditions. But now we've gone through and calculated what it should be based on the ideal gas, and these two are different. So in the next video in this series, uh, we're gonna dig into a little bit why they're different and how we can actually account for some of the differences that exist. So tune in next time to hear the exciting story of why these two values are a little bit different.